Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Anara Tabashaliva, along with co-host uh, Dr. Victor Fett, Dr. Katerina Shrey, and our program producer, Professor Larry Shrey. We host a weekly discussion panel on Russia's war on Ukraine with guests from Ukraine, military experts, medical personnel, academics, artists, literary figures, and relief workers. Our panel is recorded and circulated nationally and internationally. We appreciate your comments and feedback. Special thanks to Marshall University Libraries and MUIT for making this weekly event possible. If you are joining us live on Teams, please feel free to use the chat to post any questions to, for our guests. A quick greetings to our viewers in Ukraine from uh, Professor Katerina Shrey. The time on us is for the chill of Ukraine is for Bokim Pukrinom. Medali Svitke Vashaho Strashnoho Terpenia, it a Koshvashi Veliku Isili. Diakuje Vam Zavashu Uchesh, Nashi Tijnevi Programi. Thank you. Today's guest will be introduced by Professor Dr. Shure, oh, so by Professor Victor Fett, sorry. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 87th weekly meeting of M Ukraine Discussion Group. We are honored to welcome Dr. Timothy de Hoyt. Dr. Hoyt is Professor of Strategy and Policy, Director of the Advanced Strategy Program, and the John Nichols Brown Chair of Counterterrorism Studies at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. He is the author of Military Industries and Regional Defense Policy, over 50 articles and chapters on international security and military affairs. We are glad to have him on our weekly program. Please, Dr. Hoyt, microphone is yours. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you all and uh, welcome to viewers in Ukraine and elsewhere. If you'll hold on just a moment, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Um, all right. Pardon me while I talk to myself. That's the uh, only way I can get through um, the electronic portion of setting this up. Now, this should work as it starts. Um, I have to preface my remarks by saying uh, that any remarks that I make uh, represent my views and my views alone, uh, and not those of the U.S. Naval War College, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. government, or any other institution formally associated with the United States. Um, that's a disclaimer that we're required to make periodically since I do work for the U.S. government. Um, these should not be interpreted as policy, but rather as my own views and analysis. Um, it's both uh, sad and not surprising that this is the 87th meeting of this group. Um, unfortunately, the war in Ukraine has gone on far too long. Uh, and I'm afraid that we'll have to probably have at least a few more meetings um, like this in the future. What I'd like to do is run through a strategic analysis of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, both the background uh, and the decisions leading up to the war, and then some analysis of particularly the military and political aspects of the conflict itself. Um, I'm going to use some of the tools that we use at the U.S. Naval War College in our strategy and policy department uh, for the analysis of war and the effectiveness of military force in achieving political objectives. Um, now, when we consider strategy and its implications, uh, we divide the idea of strategy and analysis into two major sets of, of themes. The first is the environment of strategy, um, because the environment in which strategy is made fundamentally affects it. And it also provides constraints that may limit or expand its effectiveness. And then we also look at the process of strategy making within states and within coalitions, not only before the conflict, but during the conflict itself, leading up to hopefully the the end of conflict and then the post-war phase in which, in many cases, preparation for another war begins. Um, the roots of the conflict, I'm sure that many of you are much more familiar with this than I am, but I'll lay out some high points. Uh, the 2004 elec uh, loss of the election uh, by Yanukovych uh, in the Orange Revolution movement, um, and then the political uh, 
back and forth as Yanukovych is elected again in 2010, um, and then the Maidan, Maidan Resolution. Uh, in 2014, Vladimir Putin invades uh, Ukraine, uh, condemning what he calls a fascist coup. Uh, and annexes Ukraine in March of 2014. And from 2014 to 2022, uh, Ukraine and Russia fight a war, a kind of a gray zone war in areas of the Donbass. Um, now, why that escalated is really part of the study that I'll be trying to go through today. Um, the, first, the first element, and the key one, is the international dimension. Uh, states make strategy, they make plans for war, they make plans about deterring war in the context of an international dimension. The international dimension in 2022 was fairly rocky. Um, there was a perception of decline in the liberal world order, in the international order of um, you know, the liberal inter global international system. Um, and this was stated not only by Vladimir Putin, but also by other leaders, including Xi Jinping. Um, the idea that the time of liberal democracies was over and that a new time in which other forms of government were both more effective and appropriate uh, would and, and therefore would exert more influence in the international system. Uh, we see this at least in part in the United States in the new national security strategy and national defense strategy that, that President Biden uh, and his administration have articulated, looking at a period of great power competition. And the U.S. refers to this period as a period where we're going to see a struggle between liberal democracy and authoritarianism as key ideologies in the international system. Um, Part of the reason for this perception of decline was the economic and political unrest in Western democracies. This was exacerbated by COVID, but we already had seen um, the rise of very new and fairly radical shifts in both domestic and international policy in a number of states in Europe and the United States. The rise of populism, um, the Trump administration, was reassessing U.S. alliances and frequently questioned them publicly. Uh, U.S. commitment to Europe had been raised as an issue in the late Trump administration. The Biden administration was trying to reassert those commissions, but there was a sense of instability. Um, Putin in June 2021 laid out his view of Russian growth in an op-ed that's really quite frank, um, and it also basically denies Ukraine's right to exist. Um, this was noted in the West, but wasn't viewed as particularly threatening. But later in the autumn, the United States and other Western governments began to detect what they felt were preparations for an invasion. Um, and they began to make that known. Uh, discussions occurred among European leaders. The president of the United States started speaking out more frequently uh, about this issue. Um, Communications were made to Vladimir Putin and to uh, the government of Ukraine. Um, there was there was an effort to deter Russia's potential decision to invade Ukraine, primarily through political pressure and the threat of economic sanctions. Um, in February 22, 2022, uh, during the uh, during the Olympics, Putin met with Xi, with Xi Jinping and they together crafted a very interesting announcement where they declared a no limits friendship. This is slightly different from an alliance, but again, it appeared uh, to fall in line with U.S. analyses of changes in the international system and with this idea of an authoritarian, a broader authoritarian challenge to the liberal world order. In the economic dimension, uh, Russia had suffered very significantly from sanctions that were imposed in 2014, and layers of sanctions continued to be imposed on Russia uh, throughout the 2014 to 2022 period. This had limited economic growth uh, in ways that constrained Russia. But at the same time, Russia had some key assets that it hoped to use to provide leverage on the international system uh, when it launched its war. And the two most important assets that it had were food and energy. Um, and the fact that much of Europe was dependent on uh, on Russia for energy imports um, and the fact that much of the developing world was dependent on Russian food supplies, uh, this gave Russia the 
perception that it would be able to effectively limit opposition in the event that it went to war in Ukraine, which it was planning on doing by January of 2022. Um, the US promised in turn much more severe sanctions and raised a, a series of issues and a series of made a series of promises to Vladimir Putin about what the West would do in the event that war broke out. Um, but before the war began, it was still unclear, A, if this was gonna be enough to deter Putin, and B, what the global impact once the war started would be on the international community. Would the international community try to intervene abruptly to end the war, to end the economic impact, or would it be willing to accept costs um, in terms of the global food supply, in terms of global energy prices and energy supply, uh, in order to deny Russia any benefits from starting a war. The institutional dimension of strategy looks at institutions both within states and within coalitions and formal institutions, including not only the United Nations, but also alliances like NATO. Um, interestingly, key institutions, especially uh, both political analysis and intelligence institutions in Russia and the West, severely misjudged Russia's capability. Um, Russia's military capability was viewed as much stronger than it turned out to be uh, in actuality. Um, its intelligence capabilities were viewed as um, quite accurate, that it would not make failures of assessment uh, and that it would have a great deal of impact inside Ukraine in terms of uh, fomenting instability. Uh, this turned out not to be the case. Russian information warfare, which had been a major issue in American elections and American domestic politics in the 2016 to 2020 period, um, again, was overestimated. It was assumed that Russian information attacks would pose a major threat to international order, and they did not. Um, those misjudgments still require more analysis. Um, they are, it is interesting how much they inflated Russia's uh, potential strengths and misjudged Russia's potential weaknesses. At the same time, Ukraine actually performed in ways that greatly surprised many Western analyses. Um, it exhibited superb political leadership, uh, determined military resistance, which many analysts felt would not happen, uh, and they were wrong. Um, and it is winning the information battle fairly consistently uh, against, again, a Russia that had made information warfare a very important part of its strategy and its war planning. Uh, Western institutions calibrated uh, economic effects. Um, it turns out that they would not, uh, they have not been as immediately catastrophic as many analysts expected. Um, that is actually fairly reasonable given a study of the impact of sanctions. Sanctions take a long time to have effect. Um, they'll have an immediate effect, but it is fairly easy for states to adapt to them. And then it's much more of an attrition effect over time. However, we have seen Russia spend a great deal of its foreign exchange reserves to prop up the ruble internally. Um, that is a cost of sanctions. Technology has been denied fairly successfully to Russia, which has impacted not only its internal economic performance and production for domestic uh, use, but also its arms industry. Uh, and we've also seen key Western governments begin gradually to reverse policies that had been in place for 30 years with the end of the Cold War. Europe is gradually beginning to reconsider its defense budgets, to reconsider uh, both national defense industries and pan-European defense industries and their efforts, um, and to begin funding again, especially in Germany, um, national security expenditures at a much higher level than had been the case in the period from 2000 to 2020. Um, the UN had a vote. Now, because Russia has a Security Council veto, the Security Council can't do much, but the UN General Assembly has had at least two major votes in 2022 and 2023 on the Russian invasion. Each one has received, uh, Ukraine has received very substantial support in the order of 140 countries condemning the Russian invasion. 
between 30 and 40 countries have remained have uh, chosen not to vote and only a handful of countries have supported Russia and most importantly China has not supported Russia in these votes uh, which suggests that the idea that the Russian and, and Chinese inseparable friendship um, is not nearly as inseparable as they thought it was before the war now <clears throat> social and cultural dimensions of strategy um, one of the things that we consistently underestimate in the international system is the power of nationalism and the power of nationalism once it is activated, especially under threat. Um, this became a problem for the United States in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, once uh, the United States was viewed as an alien foreign occupier, nationalism became a powerful rallying cry for resistance to the US and the international community as they attempted to reestablish governance in both of those countries. Ukrainian nationalism was underestimated by the Russians, uh, by Western analysts, um, and it has proven to be an extraordinarily powerful force uh, during this conflict. There was a gross Russian misunderstanding and misinterpretation of Ukrainian society and history and of the willingness of Ukraine to peacefully join back with the greater Russia. Uh, this appears not only to have been a delusion on Putin's part, but also uh, much more importantly, a, a more broad misunderstanding across Russian academics and Russian political elites. Uh, there's an underestimation of the impact of the Ukrainian di diaspora. Um, there is a big Ukrainian diaspora in the United States, and it has mobilized in some interesting ways uh, to support Ukraine and to urge the United States to provide much more active support. Uh, there's a misunderstanding of the role of the Eastern European states in NATO and of the importance of their support, sometimes verging on independent activity uh, in in terms of providing the uh, uh, providing support to the Ukraine and urging NATO to go further and do more. Uh, the behavior of Russian troops and Russian leaders uh, has unfortunately reinforced historical perceptions of the Russian people, of Russia's actions in the international system, and of the Russian regime. They have behaved abominably, and that in turn raised greater and greater concerns within Europe about the possibility that a broader war in Europe at some point in the future might again reemerge and has contributed to decisions by governments to increase defense spending. Um, and finally, Ukraine was still in the process of making a choice between being a Russian Ukraine and a European Ukraine. This is the lesson of the first 20 years of the 21st century, is a debate and a back and forth between those who want to be more closely affiliated with Russia and those who want to be more cl closely affiliated with Europe. By invading, Russia has irrevocably pushed Ukraine towards Europe. And that is an, a predictable consequence, but apparently one that was unintended. I um, mean, here we see uh, Ukrainian leadership with European leaders, um, the distinction between a, state, a nation at war and nations at peace. Now, in terms of thinking the decision making behind strategy, um, and here I'll focus a bit on Putin and Russia, but also look a little bit more at the, bro at the broader West. Um, Putin apparently believed that the best way to restore Russia's status as a great power, which he felt had been denied by the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, was to reestablish territorial control over the areas of the former Soviet Union, with Ukraine being the most important element to control. Although Russia had engaged in wars in Georgia, uh, in Chechnya, and, uh, and in other peripheral areas, um, this was the most important area for him. And he articulated that pretty clearly in 2021 in his op-ed, and then in speeches in February 2022. The best way for him to do this, he appears to believe, was through a decisive war, um, and he believed that Ukraine was ripe for the plucking. Um, and this was a gross misunderstanding of Ukraine's circumstances. He also made an assumption, again, linking back to the international dimension of strategy, that the West wouldn't respond because it hadn't in 2014, 
And he believed that the West was weaker in 2022 than it was in 2014 because of domestic political turmoil, especially in the United States um, in the aftermath of the 2020 presidential election, which was still playing out and continues to play out in the American political system, um, but also because of the turmoil caused by COVID, um, which created a great deal of economic distress in all of these countries and rearranged their budgets and uh, impacted their domestic political systems. War, therefore, seemed like a promising a, a promising idea for Russia to reassert itself on the international stage at a time when it felt it was relatively stronger because it had weathered COVID, and at a time where it felt Ukraine was weak and the international community would not provide support. These were major misjudgments. Intelligence assessments and plans. Um, as one thinks about going to war, one has to do intelligence estimates. One has to do an assessment, both of the potential, uh, the military potential of the various com potential combatants, but also of the likelihood of the international system to intervene. And one has to make military plans that would allow one to um, use military force to most expeditiously accomplish political objectives. Now, again, because Putin's objectives here were pretty grandiose, he wanted to not only overthrow Ukraine, but he wanted to make Ukraine um, basically absorbed back into greater Russia, uh, either literally uh, becoming part of Russia or becoming a satellite of Russia that had as little autonomy as Belarus. Um, those are big objectives and would require the overthrow of the Ukrainian political system, the overthrow of the Ukrainian military, and a substantial willingness on the part of the Ukrainian people to accept Russian overlordship. Um, we don't really know uh, how much of this was purely Putin's assessment and how much of it was the assessment of the Russian military and the Russian intelligence services. Given their performance in the conflict so far, it looks as though it was a failure at virtually all levels. But again, there's still more to be learned here. Um, Russia did do some fairly clever things. It was gambling that it could uh, rapidly succeed, and therefore um, it attempted to attack from a number of different axes. Normally, one masses military force on a single axis or perhaps two, uh, and concentrates force with the intent of destroying um, or overrunning or surrounding enemy forces. Russia gambled in this case, um, and it actually went against its own military doctrine. Uh, the idea that it would throw fairly small, fairly weak columns at multiple points across the Ukrainian border, starting in the north from Belarus and then going clockwise all the way down to the Crimea, there were five or six different routes of access where the columns were going to attempt to move rapidly into Ukraine, claiming territory, hopefully claiming cities, including including Kiev, and put uh, put Ukraine in a position where it had to surrender quickly because its governance had collapsed. That was a bold decision. Um, it was, again, a wrongheaded decision. Uh, Holding exercises in Belarus may have been a key tell for Western intelligence, but the idea of using Belarusian territory to attack Kyiv um, made that attack on Kyiv much more formidable, um, much more pressing, and much more dangerous. At the same time, holding, uh, holding exercises in Belarus also wore out those troops. Um, it exhausted uh, some of the logistic preparations that those troops might have been relying on, and it caused a lot of damage to vehicles and especially supply vehicles that would be necessary for the attack because they were engaged in an exercise beforehand. Um, Western intelligence was fairly accurate in terms of thinking about broad Russian intentions. It was not nearly as accurate in thinking about how effective uh, military forces would be. Um, and Ukraine apparently had good enough intelligence to reposition both its reserves and to call up new reserves, and also especially to reposition its air force shortly before the attack. It's not clear if this was based on purely Ukrainian intelligence assessments or on information that was provided from the West, 
but for instance, Ukrainian uh, aircraft were repositioned from airfields near Kyiv just before the attack, which meant they were not caught on the ground early in the war. Um, Ukraine had its own defensive plans, and these actually worked very well. Some of them were ad hoc and reactive, but many of them had been thought out well ahead of time. And as a result, these uh, multiple Russian columns, many of them were parried uh, or defeated before they could begin to accomplish their operational goals. The decision for war, Russia chose to go to war despite Western warnings. Uh, they may have timed it in terms of late February because they didn't want to go to war at the same time that the Olympics were going on in China, having just made this public demonstration of friendship with China. There's some evidence that China may have been surprised by the attack. Uh, I, I don't think that that's clear, but there have been reports that that was a problem. Um, the, uh, the Russians also... Um, had already achieved some of their goals in Donbass. Uh, and it was, for many Western analysts, surprising that they would undertake something as risky as going after all of Ukraine, as opposed to going after more limited objectives. If they had massed forces in Donbass, they might have been able to claim territory um, fairly significantly uh, in 2022 without declaring an all-out war on Ukraine. However, instead, they chose to have relatively unlimited objectives, uh, overthrow the regime and force it to submit. And in doing so, they blunted their military advantages, those that they had. And they actually invaded Ukraine with fewer tro troops than Ukraine had in its active army in 2022. Uh, normally, one thinks uh, a successful invader should have a three to one advantage. Russia wasn't anywhere close to that. Uh, in addition, if Russia planned to occupy Ukraine, which would be an immensely complex activity, it's geographically enormous and has over 40 million citizens when they're all in the country, um, Russia would have needed a much larger military force to uh, carry out an occupation. So there was a there were big mismatches in Russian planning and the forces allotted to that planning that can only be explained by assuming that Russia made some pretty heroic assumptions about how vulnerable Ukraine was and how good the Russian military was. Um, all of those assumptions, by the way, proved incorrect. In terms of military instruments, Russia did have substantial advantages, uh, particularly in terms of equipment and particularly in terms of modern equipment. The one of the greatest surprises, and it continues to be an ongoing surprise uh, for Western analysts, is the inability of the Russian military, uh, the Russian Air Force to be nearly as decisive as Western Air Forces would both seek to be and probably would accomplish in other conflicts. Uh, the Russian Air Force has not been very useful at all. That doesn't mean that it has been useless. But um, it has not been able to provide significant combat advantages for ground forces. And uh, that's partly the result of Russian doctrine. It's partly the result of successful Ukrainian integration of a wide variety of anti-aircraft systems, um, both for defending cities and also for defending troops in the front line. Uh, it's also probably reflects the age and poor training of Russian pilots and the uh, uh, Russian aircraft. But this was a significant advantage from the perspective of the West. They felt that the Russian air power would be um, an important contribution. And it hasn't been, uh, hasn't been nearly as important as Western analysts felt. Um, the Ukrainians fought very tenaciously. Uh, the Russians on the ground fought rather poorly. Uh, they had big problems with logistics. They had big problems moving off roads. Uh, they were very tied to road uh, axes of advance, and the Ukrainians took advantage of that. The Ukrainians flooded areas, <laughs> which made it more difficult for the Russians to get off the road, especially on the in the approach to Kiev. Um, Russian artillery was fairly overwhelming early in the war. Um, it tended to be not nearly as accurate, and not nearly as precise, not nearly as uh, destructive as Ukrainian artillery, especially as the conflict progressed. But Russia was firing 60,000 shells per day 
2022, which is a, a lot of explosive being put down on the battlefield. That number has dropped precipitously, and it looks like Russian munition stocks are much lower than they were at the beginning of the conflict. But artillery was a major advantage for the Russians, especially in the battles of Donbass. Um, Russia has lost 2,500 tanks, 4,500 armored infantry carriers, and about 13,000 trucks that have been verified. I've, I've put the website for Oryx there. Um, you can link to it. Um, they look at uh, pictures of destroyed or damaged vehicles, and then they geolocate them. So it's a fairly accurate way of confirming Russian equipment losses. 2,500 tanks is a quarter of the entire tank stock that Russia possessed at the beginning of the war. And we know that they've had trouble mobilizing that tank stock. Reserve tanks that have been coming off, coming out and serving in the field have actually been, in many cases, much older. Um, tanks from the early Cold War, uh, from the 1950s and 1960s, are now appearing on the battlefield in Ukraine. So for a variety of reasons, Russia's reserve tank stock has not been nearly as useful as they thought it would be. Um, the Ukrainian army, by the way, estimates that losses are much higher. And they would probably make the argument that about half of Russia's tank stock so far has been destroyed. A lot of artillery pieces, um, you know, the the figures from Oryx are on the order of seven to eight hundred. That's out of twenty four hundred that Russia started the war with. Um, again, Ukrainian figures and estimates on this are much much higher. All estimates are imprecise, um, but. Russia has taken enormous losses. The manpower losses, again, there's a big vec uh, big space between some of the estimates. But the U.S. in the late summer of 2023 said that Russia had taken between 120 and 150,000 killed um, and maybe 300,000 total casualties. Uh, recently, the British Ministry of Defense announced that Russia had probably suffered 150 to 190,000 killed or permanently injured. Um, and didn't make an estimate on total casualties. Uh, but 150,000 military age deaths is a very substantial hit on Russian dem demographics. It's three times roughly what the United States lost in the Vietnam War, to put that in context. Um, it's 10 to 15 times what the Soviets lost in the Afghan War. Um, and in addition, because of sanctions and because of the war itself, somewhere between a half a million and a million Russian men of military age have left the country. So uh, these are very, very significant losses. Um, and they're significant losses of trained men. A lot of these are of contract soldiers who are the ones who are fighting Ukraine primarily rather than conscripts. And that means that they're losing veteran soldiers at a very high and very fast rate. Uh, Ukrainian casualties, again, the Ukrainians don't release this information for good reason. Uh, Western estimates, uh, again, in sort of the late summer of 2023, were that Ukraine may have suffered 70 to 80,000 dead and as many as 200,000 total casualties. Um, that's a significant hit to Ukraine's population, which is only a third or a fourth the size of Russia's population. Um, the one big distinction here is that Ukraine is much better at um, casualty support and getting soldiers off the battlefield and keeping them alive than Russia is. This is something that we've seen again and again uh, on all fronts of the war. The Ukrainians uh, spend a lot more time on getting, you know, trying to make, make sure that wounded soldiers survive. The Russians seem to be much more callous or perhaps just incompetent. Now, what happened after the decision for war? Because strategy takes place in an active environment. Um, the Russians had a plan. The Ukrainians had a plan. When those two plans collide, uh, each side will make will take steps that make it difficult for the other side to do what they'd hope to do. And then one has to go back to the drawing board and reassess and figure out, OK, so how do I need to respond to what has happened on the battlefield? 
Um, Russia began redefining success as early as April of 2022, uh, when they pulled back from Kyiv, uh, and they restated their objectives now were no longer to overthrow the Ukrainian government, but to hold all of the Donbass, to hold the southern land bridge that they had taken that now connect Crimea uh, to the Donbass. And they also said that they wanted to take a new land bridge to Transniestra, which would include Odessa. Um, again, they were unsuccessful at that latter at that latter task. They repositioned their forces. Um, they moved forces out of Belarusia for the most part. Uh, we have seen a later redefinition where they simply reduced their objectives, they say, to claiming four provinces, uh, the two that they're already fighting on and the Donbass, um, and then two others, which they do not uh, hold all of. But that's how they have chosen to uh, currently uh, state their territorial objectives without stating political objectives that might be associated with those. There's been a mass movement of Ukrainian citizens in the occupied areas. Many of them have been forced to go into Russia. Many children have been kidnapped and forced to go into Russia. Um, and we have seen a sort of a hardening of the battle lines in many places. Now, that wasn't true everywhere. Uh, in the summer of 2022, uh, Ukraine began getting new equipment from the West, uh, began putting more pressure on Kherson uh, and on the, uh, the Dnieper River area, but then launched a surprise attack uh, in the northern areas, which took back a great deal of land very, very quickly. They caught the Russians unprepared, and they caught the Russians in, on an area of the front where the Russians had very few reinforcements, and most of the reinforcements were fairly raw troops. So they were able to take a lot of territory back in 2022. This led, I think, the West to have um, very, very optimistic uh, impressions of what the summer 2023 offensive would be and how quickly Ukraine could uh, recapture land. Those assessments, again, proved to be quite misguided uh, on the Western side. Ukrainian assessments appear to have been much more modulated. They are much more aware of what they can do and what their limitations are and what the Russians can do. Um, so I think there's been a lot of misjudgment in the Western press in the summer and autumn of 2023 about how well Ukraine is doing. Um, in the winter of, of 2023, or of 2022-23, um, Putin ordered an additional mobilization. Uh, he reinforced units, he started building new units, he attacked the Ukrainian electrical grid. Um, you can see here from these war zone maps, the distinction between the situation in March 2022, the map on our left, and then in October of 2022, when Ukraine had relieved pressure on Kyiv and relieved pressure, pressure on Kharkiv. Um, at this point, the battle line began to harden and the war turned into one more of attrition than movement. Uh, in 2023, we've seen some major operations, though. The Russians have fought very hard around Bakhmut. This became an extraordinarily important political and symbolic objective uh, for Putin. And the estimates that I just read recently were that the Russians lost between 35 and 45,000 men killed and maybe as many as 100,000 wounded attacking Bakhmut. Um, the Ukrainians dug in hard uh, to defend it. Uh, they apparently have only lost about 20% as many men as the Russians have. The Russians have used uh, tactics that were very extravagant in terms of manpower losses and suffered for that as a result. Uh, and Bakhmut remains in, in Ukrainian hands. The Ukrainian summer offensive in the south ran into uh, well-prepared and well-defended Russian uh, fortified lines and minefields. And as a result, Russia or Ukraine could not fight a war of movement. It had to fight a war, sort of persistent attrition of taking one small strong point at a time. Uh, they have fought that, in my perception, very effectively in terms of managing their losses and inflicting great losses on the Russian defenders. This is an immensely complicated tactical um, and operational problem. 
And Ukraine has chosen to fight it in a way that is very methodical, uh, that is very systematic, and that minimizes their own losses, which is probably the best one can do in this kind of tactical circumstance. It is a lot like the war in Korea in 1952 or the First World War on the Western Front um, from 1915 to 1917, uh, where massing troops in the face of large amounts of potential artillery fire. It's just very, very dangerous. It's a recipe for high losses. So instead, what the Ukrainians have been doing has been fighting with much smaller units, making very small uh, penetrations into Russian occupied territory, but they have compounded over time to pose a threat to the Russian defensive line. Most recently in November uh, or in, in October, Russia has counterattacked in the east, and we see a massive attempt around Avdivka. Uh, this has brought in tens of thousands of new Russian troops. Uh, they've put a lot of equipment in the field, and they've suffered very, very heavy losses. Uh, this is underreported, again, I think, in the Western press, partly because of events that have been happening in other parts of the world. But the Russian attacks around Avdivka have been very high loss and have shown very little um, payback for those attacks. In fact, they may have made the Russians more vulnerable there as the Ukrainians refocus their, their, uh, their own efforts. Thinking about war termination, there are usually three key questions when you go to war. The first is how far are you going to go militarily? Um, what are you going to try and achieve militarily uh, and how much leverage will that give you at peace talks? In some cases, you want to overthrow the country and occupy it. Um, other times you're seeking to put enough pressure on your, your adversary that they have to make concessions politically. So the second question then becomes, what do you demand at the peace table? Um, how much territory, what kinds of concessions? Uh, and then the third big question, when the war is over, how do you enforce the peace? Uh, how do you prevent war from breaking out again uh, on the political conditions that started the current war in the first place? What we know is that Russian objectives are incompatible with Ukrainian objectives. Um, Russia wants to hold what it's got and even has a claim to more territory. The Ukrainians want to take back what was Ukraine in 2014? Those are not compatible objectives. It doesn't mean that at some point in the future they couldn't negotiate a compromise, but for the moment, those objectives are pretty incompatible. Um, so I believe a, a negotiation is unlikely to be successful at this point. Both sides see an advantage in continuing fighting because they may get more of what they want in actuality, as opposed to having to get it, it through a negotiation. Uh, the West can play a spoiler role here. Um, Western support for Ukraine is critical. And if we don't maintain that support for Ukraine, Ukraine's efforts, um, will they will continue fighting, uh, but fighting and winning will be much, much more complicated. Uh, Ukraine's economy has been devastated by the war and it is much smaller than Russia. It depends to a great extent on Western help. Uh, so what happens in Western domestic politics, and especially what happens in the United States over the next couple of years, both the role of Congress in the coming year and then the presidential election in 2024, may play major roles um, in the war in Ukraine. We know that uh, President Trump is not nearly as interested in supporting Ukraine as President Biden is. And we know that there are elements in Congress that don't want to provide aid to Ukraine for a variety of reasons. If those elements come to the fore, um, Ukraine can fight the war without USA, but it will be much more difficult and it will be much more costly. Um, the key factor here, however, I believe is Putin. Uh, he can turn the war off at any time. Um, this is his war. Uh, he can at some point make a decision to simply terminate the fighting and either make concessions to the Ukrainians or not. Uh, but as long as he wants to fight, as long as he sees value in the war, then the war will continue. Um, there are a couple of ways the wars could end or could be forced to an end by things that happen on the battlefield. 
Um, the first would be the, a major Russian military revival. And there are people in the United States who believe that this is possible, that Russia could mobilize its society, could call up many more draftees, could uh, revitalize its military industries to create equipment um, and become a juggernaut, uh, more like the Soviet Union of the you know, 1970s and 1980s. Um, what we're seeing in terms of Russia being able to reconstitute combat power doesn't really support that hypothesis. Um, in fact, they're having a lot of trouble uh, recreating combat power. Um, they create new units, but they've lost most of their veteran soldiers, most of their veteran officers. Um, the new units that they're, that they're creating often don't have time to really train and practice and become uh, facile at combined arms operations. Instead, they're formed together into units, they're given equipment, they're thrown right into the front line. And then they take very high losses as a result. Um, a second hypothesis could be a Russian military collapse. Um, Russia, in the past, the army has collapsed due to a combination of social factors and defeat on the battlefield. It's unclear if this Russian army is more like the army of 1915, uh, which fought on for several years, uh, despite all of the losses it had taken, or the Russian army of 1917, which was much more vulnerable and collapsed in social revolutions. Russia doesn't appear to be ready for a social revolution yet, but that does not preclude the possibility that the army um, suffers significant failures in capability and may not be able to hold key sectors in the front. That is a possibility at some point in the future. Um, Putin being removed from power, uh, that certainly would change the, the text, uh, context of the war. The possibility that the Ukrainian government co could collapse. Uh, this would probably first be um, you know, the first indicator would be a substantial drop in Western support, um, but it is possible. It doesn't seem likely at this point. Uh, similarly, you could have a situation where Ukraine liberates its territory. Um, that would probably require a Russian military collapse, but it is feasible. You could have a Russian nuclear demonstration. That is a very significant concern on the part of the West and certainly on the part of the United States and the Biden administration. Um, any of those could affect the military context and then affect, therefore, the political outcome of the war, but none of them seem particularly likely in the short term. Um, negotiation and compromise just don't seem feasible at this time. There's just not common ground. Neither side has military pressure that would compel the enemy to negotiate. Both sides feel that they can get more next year through an increased fighting. Um, and we don't know what the impact of sanctions is on the Russian domestic economy. Uh, it will continue to get worse. Uh, at some point, it may be a much greater player. Russia is exhausting substantial amounts of the foreign exchange reserves that it prepared before the war began as a buffer. Uh, and about half of those foreign exchange reserves were impounded by Western sanctions at the beginning of the conflict. So there may be an economic timeline that plays into this. Uh, I think, however, for the near future, the most likely result is gonna be a war of attrition. Something like um, either what happened in Korea in 1951 and 1952 with massed forces in the field um, and sort of episodic probes to see if one side can get advantage or the other, or even something a little bit more low intensity, like the war of attrition that happened in the Middle East, where the battle lines are drawn, but the fighting sort of dies down by mutual acceptance. Um, this happened especially between Israel and Egypt from 1968 to 1970. Uh, but this will be a continued strain on Ukraine. Um, winning the peace and preparing for war, uh, Karl von Clausewitz tells us in war, the result is rarely ever final. Uh, and in this case, uh, until Russia abandons its determination to reunify with U Ukraine, Ukraine has to always prepare for war. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it's just a it's a fact of life. And the only ways in which it can be sort of assured that it doesn't need to do that anymore is either through a verifiable change of policy in Russia, uh, which seems impossible under the Putin administration because Putin does not keep agreements. Um, or NATO membership or some other security guarantee from the West, uh, which Putin is fighting in order to prevent. Uh, that doesn't mean it won't happen, by the way. Uh, it just means that um, 
you know, that is that is a probably the most likely outcome, whatever happens on the battlefield in the next couple of years. Um, a UN peacekeeping operation might be a, a possibility, but this is an enormous battlefront of, you know, thousands of kilometers. Um, it's bigger than anything the UN has ever attempted. Uh, and it's against, a it would be a UN peacekeeping operation against a Security Council member, which would be very, very difficult indeed. So I don't think the UN can play that kind of a role here. One thing I think we can all agree on, though, is this has been a strategic disaster for Russia. If you think about Putin's aims at the beginning of the war, he wanted to restore Russia's greatness. He wanted to discredit democracy, divide the U.S. and Europe, keep Ukraine out of European institutions, end what he calls NATO expansion, and absorb Ukraine into greater Russia. In January of 2022, he might have been able to look at the world and say that Russia was making progress on each of these things. As soon as he invaded Ukraine, he undermined Russia's position in all of these different aims and objectives. Going to war has had negative impacts on all of them. The Russian military, its economy, and its reputation will take years, if not decades, to recover. So when we think about uh, Russia's future, this may be a useful graphic to look at. This is the Moskva which was the largest ship in the Black Sea, the most impressive military capability um, of any naval unit in the Black Sea and the flagship of the Russian Black Sea fleet. Uh, it is now sunk. Um, and with that, uh, I would be glad to take any questions or have any discussion that you'd like to have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hurt. Thank you profoundly for your wonderful and uh, very professional presentation. I open panel to questions from our regulars. I see Dr. Deutsch, our former graduate dean of Marshall University. Please, Dr. Deutsch. You, uh, you mentioned that the Russians conducted maneuvers in Belarus, and you suggested that they tired them out. I'm wondering uh, what uh, future role do you see Belarus playing in this uh, war? Um, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, my sense, and I do not claim to be a Belarusian expert. <laughs> my sense is that um, they were a good ally before the war began. In terms of, Putin said, "I want to use your territory. I'm going to knock out Ukraine." in three or four days, uh, if I can use your territory, can I use your territory? And the Belarusians said, okay, yeah. Um, there's a big power disparity between Belarusia and the Belarusian regime is heavily linked with Putin. Um, my sense since then, however, is that they are really trying to keep their head well below the, the top of the foxhole. Um, they don't want anything to do with this. Now, there were rumors in 2022 that the Belarusian army might invade Ukraine. Uh, those clearly didn't pan out. There have been rumors about the Wagner Group moving into Belarusia and using that as a place to refit or perhaps operate from. Those rumors appear to be very tenuous um, and not have, uh, they haven't, they haven't panned out either. Um, it's still unclear what's happening with the Wagner Group in Russia. It continues operating in the developing world. So my sense is that Belarusia doesn't see this as something that it can gain much from. And as a result, it will probably be a complicit partner, uh, but at as low a level as, uh, a, a, as low a level of cooperation as it can manage. Um, and I think Putin has put himself in a position we've seen elsewhere. He's exhausting so much of his military capability against Ukraine that the threat of military coercion over Belarus is no longer as imposing as it might have been a year or two ago. So Putin is going to have to rely more on Belarusian cooperation than on coercion. Uh, and again, that that gives Belarus more autonomy. Um, and more operating room. And I would suspect that we won't see a lot of outright cooperation. But I, I cheerfully confess, 
that's more based on theory and sort of observation than on deep knowledge of the Belarusian regime. Well, I hope your vision pans out. Thank you for your response. Thank you very much, Dr. Deutsch. I see a question from Anara. Please, Anara. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Very comprehensive. I have a couple questions. Sure. How to avoid a lone war and their fear, their legitimate fear that even after peace, uh, Russia may, like Germany after World War I, uh, recover and attack neighboring states. Of course, uh, after Ukraine, there might be Moldova, Armenia, Georgia, and even Central Asian states. Right. So that's we we can see that actually the big picture, and the second question: some experts say that Ukraine has right, a legal right to target Russian territory. Should Ukraine uh, take the war into Russia? Uh, although Zelensky stated that uh, Ukrainian troops will not attack Russian territory, and and uh, the question is: uh, uh, Can you uh, Ukraine use the uh, Western? weaponry inside Russia mm -hmm. in order to actually reach it, uh, 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 goals. Thank you. Certainly. Um, well, the first the first question in terms of how do we prevent a long war? Um, there's no easy way to do that. Uh, Russia has a huge resource advantage over Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine does not have the military capability to decisively defeat Russia or to overthrow the Russian government, except over probably a protracted war that would create enough dissent inside Russia that Putin would become vulnerable. So there's no easy prescription for shortening the war uh, as long as the objectives of the two sides are so incompatible. Um, there would be some who would argue, and there may be some truth to this, that the best way to shorten the war is actually for the West to be much more aggressive about providing much more uh, e military support, both in terms of quantity and in terms of quality to the Ukrainian armed forces. That the best way to end the war is to do so much damage to the Russian military that Putin has to quit. Um, I think there's a logic to that argument. Um, however, the Western coalition has shown a lot of restraint in what it's provided to the Ukrainian military, both out of concern, some of which is probably legitimate, that the Ukrainian military may not be able to absorb some of this equipment very quickly. It requires a lot of training. It requires a lot of uh, logistics. Um, you know, the American M1A1 tank, which we hear a great deal about from time to time, is just an enormous logistic burden. Um, most armies in the world couldn't manage it in large numbers. Only the Americans can because we have created an army basically that can sustain it. Um, so more equipment, the West has been constrained in the equipment it has given. And I think this bleeds into your second question about Ukraine attacking Russia. Um, first, and I would state again, this is only my opinion. I am not reflecting U.S. policy. Uh, it looks to me like Ukraine is attacking inside Russia. Uh, they're doing it with special forces. They're doing it with uh, covert elements, espionage, sabotage. Um, there have been a lot of interesting fires and in interesting places in Russia, um, including as far as, as far away as the Pacific region. Uh, that have attacked military installations, that have attacked military industries, that have attacked key design um, bureaus for aviation. Uh, things are happening inside Russia that are war related that Ukraine is not claiming credit for, but one could easily create a scenario where some of this is being carried out by Ukraine very deliberately. Um, in terms of weaponry that could attack inside Russia, the United States has been unwilling to give it. Um, and that's, you know, that's a that's a fact that has everything to do with U.S. politics and U.S. assessments of the uh, concerns about escalation and nothing to do with whether you whether or how Ukraine would use it. Um, I think we've already seen, though, uh, in the past month or two, apparently, 
Um, more long-range missiles of U.S. make have been provided to Ukraine, and they were recently used in an airstrike on an airfield, uh, which uh, killed a bunch of helicopters. So it was very effective. Um, we may continue to see uh, longer and longer range and more and more capable equipment coming into Ukraine's hands, especially over the winter months, where the Ukrainians will probably be constrained in terms of offensive operations in some sectors by the weather and by the mud. Uh, this would give them time to train on new weapons so that come next summer, when they might launch another offensive, they would have additional advantages the way they did in 2022 when they got Western 155 millimeter artillery and high Mars and the way they did in 2023 when they got more Western tanks and, and military vehicles. Um, so I can see this coming in a trickle. I understand that the Ukrainians would want it in a flood. I mean, they want everything that they want uh, and they're in the middle of a war for their very existence. I can understand why they are frustrated with the West. But this is a coalition. And it will move at the pace um, of the most important players. Um, and many in the Western coalition are still concerned about Russian nuclear escalation and therefore would want to limit the ability of Ukraine to strike with conventional weapons deep into Russian territory. I think that will be a debate that will continue on through the winter and well into next year. Um, and I don't see it resolving easily. I, I hope that answers your questions. Yes, thank you very much. Hmm? Thank you, Dr. Hoyt. I see uh, one raised hand from Yefin Somin, and I also see a couple of questions in the chat. Yefin, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoyt. Um, question is, I wonder if you, if you maybe you could comment uh, a little more on the uh, current situation in the fronts and uh, what you think might happen in the next uh, month or two or whatever time frame is reasonable to uh, to try to make a prediction thank you um yeah predictions are predictions have almost always proven wrong in this war as in most wars um i would say um the russians have just thrown a lot of forces uh, in the north and this has been the result of a sort of an interesting game of musical chairs, where the, at one point they pulled a lot of troops out of the north um, of the Abdivka area, and they moved them down to the South to reinforce because it looked like the Ukrainians were on the verge of breaking through one of the defensive lines. They're, they're currently deep inside the second defensive belt. Um, in doing that, they then had to rush uh, some very green troops that had just been mobilized and, and an army that had just been created into the northern front where it took very heavy casualties. Um, now they have put a lot of additional new forces into that sector. Uh, and the Ukrainians appear to have done a great deal of damage to them. Um, they've engaged again in sort of reckless attacks where their tactics and their operational um, coordination have been have been pretty weak and the Ukrainians have been able to bring a great deal of firepower to bear. Uh, we've seen the Ukrainians move a couple of units up to that sector. It's not clear if that was to give them a chance to sort of rest and refit in a less active sector or if they're actually moving some of these units, especially the 47th Mechanized Brigade, which has uh, German and Swedish tanks. Um, it's not clear if that's to do a counteroffensive, of a counter counteroffensive <laughs> of sorts against the Russians there, um, or if it's just to give them a chance to rest and refit in an area where there's a little less activity. But the northern sector and the southern sector seem to be the two areas where there's the most possibility for movement. In the south, it will be pretty limited in terms of distance and territory, um, but where we might see an impact again, with new longer range weaponry available to Ukraine, if they can penetrate a little bit deeper in the southern sector, they may be able to put a lot more pressure on the road network down by the Azov Sea. And that uh, creates logistic strains for the Russian armies and basically splits them. Uh, in the north, um, I think if we see movement there, it's probably gonna be attrition. Uh, where the Ukrainians might decide, no, we'll throw some units in here and we'll try and really chew the Russians up. Um, no F-16? Uh, 
I think the F-16s they're training on, but I don't think they will get into theater probably until 2024. Um, so I, I think we will see more Ukrainian progress. Um, I don't think it, I don't think the right way to measure it is in terms of how much territory they recapture. Um, when we see Ukrainian progress, we're going to see it in terms of our Russian units uh, just really, really badly damaged. And the longer that Ukraine can continue to batter the Russian army, the lower its relative combat cap capabilities will become because they'll have to either reinforce existing units with large amounts of untrained manpower, or they'll have to form new units that they don't really have the leadership or the training time for and throw them back into the battlefield the way they did with the 25th Combined Arms Army in the north. Um, either of those is a recipe for just continuing high losses and the relative balance between Ukraine's military power and Russia's military power will continue to decline. Russia will always have greater numbers, but Ukrainian forces are simply much better at this point um, in most sectors of the theater. That is not a recipe for decisive victory. I don't expect one uh, at any time, uh, not until at a minimum uh, the summer of 2024. Um, but what Ukraine has to do is to continue battering the Russian army to the point where if the fighting continues in the summer of 2024, that Russian army is as eroded and, and as relatively weak as possible so that Ukraine then might be able to, um, you know, exert a more decisive maneuver uh, given a combination of new Western weapon systems and re retrained and refreshed units so that it's able to pull off the line while it goes into a defensive mode during the winter. I know that's a complex answer. I hope that answers your okay, question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ifim and Dr. Hoyt. I see uh, two more, uh, one more raised hand and more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, Dr. absolutely. Dr. McAllister, if you are here, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, you kind of just answered the question. Uh, when I worry about this, and I think everybody on this call is rooting pretty hard yeah. for Ukraine. Um, it seems to me that Putin has adopted a strategy of waiting out the West, yeah. of trying to erode Western political support for this in hopes that he can get in, in the fall of 2024 a president that he can deal with, and he may even be encouraged by the news. And then on the other side, on the Ukrainian side, just exactly what you were talking about, they seem to have adopted a strategy of what General McRae calls corrosion, of gradually yeah, yeah. destroying the Russian logistics base, uh, the new uh, the addition of attack and missiles and that kind of stuff, high Mars and all those things as they can bring those that road network down toward the Sea of Azov. And, and it looks like, to me, it looks like the spring, like you just said, the spring of summer 2024 could be very decisive. Um, is there a chance that you could get at least a Ukrainian penetration to the Sea of Azov in some way, partially through, like you talked about, the collapse of Russian forces? And any reaction to the um, Ukrainians' attempts to get across the Dnipro? Is that just a raid, or do you think that's more significant? Um, okay, let me answer the Dnipro first. Um, so far, what we've seen is mostly light units. Um, you know, we're not seeing we're not seeing big formations come across the Dnipro. We're seeing light units that are coming, and they're chasing Russians away, and they're bloodying the Russians when they counterattack. They're backed by artillery on the other side of the Dnipro. Um, moving major units across, uh, we may not we may not see that soon. Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, you would need to sustain them is the big problem. There'd be a big logistic challenge if you start moving a lot of armor, for instance, across a lot of vehicles. Uh, and there just aren't that many bridges across the Dnipro. So that creates uh, that creates some limits on the Ukrainian side. I suspect they'll keep infiltrating more and more infantry units across 
until they get to a point where they can maybe do something more significant because they've done a lot they've been able to do a lot with infantry artillery combinations they've been able to do a lot of tank hunting with uh you know infantry anti-tank weapons um it's just not going to be a breakout theater i don't think it's going to be one of gradual infiltration and at some point we may wake up one morning and find out that the bridgeheads are all united you know or something like that um but I think the logistic challenges still are pretty formidable. In terms of 2024, um, I guess the way I would assess it is a lot depends on how much and what gets to the Ukrainians over the winter. And what we've seen recently, I'm trying not to get into domestic politics because partisan politics is not my job. Um, and, Understood. you know, I think the Biden administration has asked for something on the order of $70 billion in aid to Ukraine. Um, my read on that, well, first off, that's got to get through Congress. And the new Speaker of the House uh, is much more hostile to aid to Ukraine than his predecessor. But that doesn't mean that there still won't be a package that goes through. And President Biden has made this priority. One of the reasons I think he asked for so much is out of concern that after 2024, the political situation in the U.S. may be much more hostile to aid to Ukraine. So let's get a lot of stuff in there now. If that's the case, um, if they can get the bill passed, the pace of U.S. supply to Ukraine, which has tended to be um, sort of pedestrian because there are big bureaucratic battles in moving stuff, in getting contracts signed, um, in you know pulling stuff out of armories elsewhere so that you can transport it to Ukraine. You know, the six months between January and June of 2024, if the U.S. pulls a major push and really dumps a lot of stuff into Ukraine, you might then see an opportunity for some kind of um, uh, for a much greater chance of a breakthrough through Russia's fortified lines, because Ukraine would then have a, a much bigger mass of very effective equipment and very deadly equipment, uh, especially, again, if it's able to continue this, I, I like the term corrosion. I think of it as attrition of Russian combat capability. If we don't see this big surge, if if aid continues to trickle, um, then the Ukrainians are reliant on firepower eroding uh, Russian capacity. Um, and that might still achieve in sectors of the front, the collapse that would allow them to break out. But I think, uh, you know, if you want to increase that chance, then the West really has to lean well forward and push equipment into Ukraine uh, as quickly as possible in order to in order to really build up a sort of a critical mass of capacity for early in the summer offensive. Um, we we sent a lot of stuff this past year, but they didn't really have that critical mass to break through a major fortified line. I mean, there's a reason the Germans didn't attack the Maginot line in 1940 with armor. Um, because it just would have been hard to get the kind of results they wanted. They outflanked it instead. Um, the Ukrainians tried the first couple of days to see if they could sort of mass armor and combat power, and they found out that against a defensive line that has a lot of artillery backing, um, no, it was really too dangerous. When you mass capability, when you mass troops for any length of time, they become targets, and this is something the Russians have been finding out constantly. So I think... You know, again, it, it really comes down to the West. The West can provide um, greater capability for Ukraine that would increase its potential for that breakthrough, but not necessarily guarantee it. Um, if the West doesn't surge that capability into theater, the possibility of a breakthrough still exists, but it's uh, the percentage chance of success is much lower, I think, um, unless Ukraine is willing to take a gamble and risk very high personnel losses. And there are lots of reasons for it to be very sensitive to that. If it's gonna be a long war, you don't want to take big personnel losses. So sorry for a long circular answer. But oh, that was great, I I that was great. That. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoyt. Uh, I, I read two questions we have in chat. Um, do you think that Russians are trying to forestall an Im imminent collapse with the recent announcement that Russians are executing their own soldiers for retreating? Um, we've actually seen reports of that uh, fairly consistently through the through the uh, conflict. 
if I can dive back to history, um, this, the Red Army, the Soviet Army in the, in the Great Patriotic War, the Second World War, uh, relied heavily on uh, prisoner battalions to make breakthroughs um, on the front in most of its major offenses from 1942 to 1944. And those penal battalions always had the NKVD, the secret police, behind them with machine guns so that they couldn't retreat. Uh, the, the big first reports we saw of this happening came in the winter when the Wagner uh, group began recruiting prisoners. And there were reports they recruited as many as 50,000 prisoners, and it took huge losses around Bakhmut. But at that point, we began seeing reports that those prisoner units, their job was to move forward, expose Ukrainian defenses, and then fall down if they were still alive. And then more prisoners would be sent forward, and that there were units behind the prisoner units that would fire if the prisoner units retreated. So this has been going on for 10 or 11 months now. Um, now it appears to be happening with regular army units. Um, whether that's a sign of imminent collapse, I don't know, but it is a sign that at some level of decision-making, they're getting worried that units will retreat and they really don't want units to retreat. They want units to fight in place, especially in these defensive lines. One of the things that we've seen in the defensive lines is the Russians fight. Um, if the Ukrainians take the defensive line, the Russians immediately launch major counterattacks to take it back. That's their preferred tactic. Uh, if the defensive lines retreat rather than holding, um, that will not only disrupt the counterattack because the counterattack will have to come through retreating troops, but it might actually lead to panic. So one way of interpreting this may be to say, this is Russia's way of saying, no, if you're in a defensive line, you're going to stay there. Um, does that mean collapse? I don't know. Uh, but it does suggest that the Russians are aware of a greater vulnerability in those defensive lines than they had six months ago. Thank you. And one more question from different perspective. Do you think the war is affecting Chinese strategy regarding Taiwan? I am having this uh, debate with colleagues fairly regularly. Um, there's two ways to think about it. Um, one is that the Chinese might be thinking, oh, you know, all this Western equipment is going into Ukraine. That makes Taiwan more vulnerable. Um, and that is a possibility. Uh, my perspective would be if I were China and I had spent a lot of time training my military with the Russians. Um, when you train with with other countries, you gain some appreciation and some assessment about what you think their armies are capable of doing. And you then can compare your own performance to them and see, are we better? Are we worse? Are we relatively as good? Uh, I think most Western analysts, and I would assume then most Chinese analysts, thought that the Russian army was really pretty good in 2020 and 2021. That was what we were hearing coming out of Western analysis. Um, and so if the Chinese thought that the Russian army was pretty good, and then they compared themselves to the Russian army, and they thought, well, we're pretty good too. Um, the events of the last 18 months suggest that the Russian army really wasn't very good. And if the Chinese can do sort of accurate self-assessment, which may be hard in their political system, but if they can do accurate self-assessment, I would be thinking as the Chinese, boy, I may not be as good as I think I am. And if I'm not as good as I think I am, I probably shouldn't go after Taiwan right now, right? Or there's a bunch of stuff that I need to do before I think seriously about going after Taiwan. I'm not sure I'm right. I mean, I know at some level I'm right in theory. I'm not sure if I'm right in terms of how the Chinese military is responding. But there's a lot of there's a lot of good evidence out there for the Chinese that um, assumptions they made about the relative uh, balance between Russian slash authoritarian trained armies and Western slash democratic trained armies. Um, may be wrong. And that might suggest, you know, we've seen, for instance, Ukraine, despite having a much weaker air force, has been able to deny the Russians access to 
uh, flying easily over the battlefield through a combination of ground-based missiles and using their air force as creatively as they can. Uh, Taiwan may be able to do the same thing. And the Chinese presumably have placed a lot of emphasis on the idea that they would control the air because they have a much bigger air force than Taiwan. I'd be reassessing that if I were the Chinese and I were seriously thinking about going to war. Whether they are or not, I can't guarantee. But I think a lot of the lessons that they might learn out of this war is that, wow, big wars with armies with hundreds of thousands of people um, are much more complex than we assumed. And there are whole waves of things that are much more important than we originally thought, like the combination of small handheld drones and artillery fire from 20 kilometers behind the front. All of a sudden, that small handheld drone makes artillery fire much, much more effective, right? And that changes the way in which you think about how can my military operate in sort of constricted areas. So I do think personally, the Chinese probably are are more hesitant about going to war at this point. I mean, they, look, they also saw the one of the biggest ships in the Russian Navy uh, sank fairly spectacularly. And they have to move a lot of things by sea if they want to attack Taiwan. Again, there may be lots of opportunity for reassessment here. Um, I would hope that it has a deterrent effect rather than a stimulating effect. But some of my colleagues disagree. <laughs> Thank you. And the last question here. Um, Ukraine is fighting, but we know that there was never total mobilization in Ukraine. Never uh, draft, universal draft was never uh, in place. Do you think it is likely to happen or it should happen? Um, I think that's probably a decision that the the government is going to have to take. Um, I would assume that you would only step up beyond what's currently happening if the military situation got significantly worse or if attrition had gotten so bad that you were really having trouble manning the front lines, um, then you go to conscription. We've seen some sort of episodic reports of people not wanting to join the military. Um, I think those are uh, anecdotal rather than consistent across Ukrainian society. It seems to me that Ukrainian society um, is uh, sad that it has to defend itself, but still eager to defend itself. Um, so I'm not sure that conscription is the answer uh, at this point. But again, I don't know the complexity of the social and political situation inside Ukraine, and especially the manpower situation, because a lot of a lot of people have fled the country. Um, so I think it would be dependent on that. Um, I don't necessarily think it's I don't think it's necessary right now. What I'm seeing on the battlefield is that Russian advantages are eroding, uh, but at the same time, they still have a lot of people. Ukrainian loss ratios to Russian loss ratios seem pretty favorable. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to put a lot more men in the field right away, would be my guess. But again, I defer to Zelensky and, and his cabinet. Uh, they certainly know the situation much better than I do. Thank you. Thank you very much for your analysis. Uh, this was amazing and uh, questions and answers were very uh, deep and important. We will conclude now our uh, Friday meeting and I will ask Dr. Katerina Shrey to give our customary greeting to our Ukrainian viewers. Дорогі братья і сестри в Україні, ми зберігаємо вас у наших щоденних думках і молитвах. Нехай милосердний Бог тримає вас у своїй опіці. До наступного тижня прощаємося. Слава Україні. Героям слава. God bless Ukraine. God bless America. Thank you very much.